I want to first welcome everybody. My name is Christina Baxter and myself and my colleague Jeff Stoll will be providing you with our take on uh, PPE and the use of relative relevant challenge levels that are operationally set. So as we go through today, for those of you who were able to join us in our January webinar, we talked a lot about how do we select the chemicals themselves that we use for our challenges. And today we're going to focus on how do we then pick the level of the challenge because we need to compare that back to operational relevance. Now, I'm going to give you fair warning as we go through today. Uh, we did put a lot of information in the slides. It's not meant for you to be able to absorb all of that today, but because we are videoing this and recording it, I actually did hit record this time, we are going to be able to put this online for you to be able to go back and look to. So we did put a lot of extra data on the slides, as well as references for you to be able to go and get more information. So. For background, my name is Christina Baxter. I own a company called Emergency Response Tips, and I'm a partner in another training company called Hazard 3. My background is uh, hazardous materials response and CBRN program management. So while I was uh, prior to Department of Defense, I worked in the fire service and managed hazmat teams. And then fast forward, went to Department of Defense for many years and oversaw the Chem Bio Rad Nuke and Explosives program at the Combat and Terrorism Technical Support Office. Now, from there, I have maintained my interest in this area and still man and, uh, and the chairperson for all of the NFPA standards for chemical protective clothing today. So I'm going to pass it over, introduce Jeff. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to be have you part of our webinar today. So my background is, uh, first of all, Jeffrey Stull with International Personal Protection. That's a company I formed back in 1993 to provide research support and testing support to a variety of different types of clients. Uh, before that, uh, I started out in the U.S. Coast Guard. I was involved with their Office of Research and Development, specifically to support the development of personal protective equipment for first responders, Coast Guard having an early role in the 1980s and late 70s for oil spill and chemi marine chemical response. Um, since that time, I went to Texas Research Institute where that organization conducted a variety of different projects for both government and commercial clients related to various forms of protective clothing. We were at a certification organization at one point, and then and as I indicated, 1993 formed International Personal Protection. And this is a company that provides uh, a variety of services related specifically to PPE, whether it be fire service or industrial or medical. And a lot of the work that I do has to deal with standards. Uh, and so one of the roles that I had, like Christina, I've been active in various standards organizations over the years that includes the National Fire Protection Association for first responder PPE. Also, ASTM International, which writes standards test methods and does other products for things like healthcare, PPE, and, and other related products. And for a time, I was involved very heavily with the International Standards Organization for PPE standards on the behalf of the United States. So, very glad to have you all present today, and we hope you can get a lot out of today's presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Now, I want to Again, apologize for the ungodly early hour for our friends over in uh, Australia, Asia, and some of the other countries over there that are in the very early hours of tomorrow morning to us. And then also to our European friends, I know uh, Rebecca and all, you are up quite late to be able to listen in. And we thank you for joining us. And hopefully you'll find this interesting and find it beneficial to keep you up late. So we're going to start off, and our goals today are really to identify the tasks that are involved in a hazmat event or CBRN event, and then figure out what the levels of chemicals are that we would expect in each of those different encounters, because that is what has to drive the challenge level that we use in the standards. And then to compare those tasks against the physical hazards that the material might endure, are there things that are sharp? Are there things that um, have different temperatures? Is there radiant heat? Those different types of things that we need to make sure the material can handle. And then also 
the length of work that we're going to do and the type of work. What are we performing? What's the work rate we're performing at? And can we manage that in the type of environment that chemical protective clothing provides to the operator? I want to remind everybody that this video will be available online at both my emergencyresponsetips.com website under training and at a website that Jeff and I both do together called rethinklevela.com under the training page. And you can find the last webinar as well as many other things that we've done attached to those websites. So let's start out with the realities of a chemical exposure. For all of us that have worked in this field, uh, the majority of our exposures are very short term and really are at low concentrations. We're taught from the very get go to avoid contact with the chemicals. And we are also taught to monitor and use our monitors to help us detect what chemicals are there and how much. And then we use administrative controls to try to reduce the amount of chemical that we come into contact with. In reality, PPE is our last administrative control that we resort to, and it needs to be um, protective for what we need. I'm going to let, as we go through today, you're going to see that the challenges that we do have here are greatly exceeding what we really need, but we like to always have that safety measure in case. So you'll see that we often pick our standards based upon a respiratory level that's based upon inhalation. Whereas what we're really getting the exposure to is our dermal exposure. Much less amount um, that will get through your skin than if you inhale. So we have that built-in safety factor there as well. And then remember that the issue that we have in most hazmat accidents to the responder either involved a flammable event with something like propane, they involved an explosion of something, but most others are accidents that are due to the PPE and loss of functionality. So when we are trying to maneuver different things but have a big shield that limits our visibility or the gloves aren't providing us the ability to have tactical uh, feel and be able to do certain things, those are where most of our chemical exposures come from. And when we start talking about the selection of PPE, we have to consider the operational environment we're going to be in the toxicity of the chemical, as well as the flammability of that chemical. And when we talk about the work that we're doing, we need to understand the actual tasks we're gonna perform, where we're gonna perform it, and how long we expect it to occur and to take, because that's all gonna dictate not only our respiratory protection, but the chemical protective clothing that we're gonna choose for that given event. So when we start thinking about the realities of exposure, we have a series of questions that we have to ask ourselves. So the first is the chemical identity and concentration. Is the chemical an inhalation hazard, a dermal hazard, or a flammability hazard? Or is it all of the above? And in different cases, you may have something, you have something like ammonia, which is definitely an inhalation hazard. It becomes a dermal hazard when you're up in the thousands of parts per million but it becomes a flammable hazard when you're in the tens of thousands of parts per millions. So based upon where you are in that chemical concentration realm, you have different threats that you have to deal with. You always have the inhalation, but as you go up, you start to get dermal threats and you start to get flammability threats. And unfortunately for us, we need to consider all of those. The other thing we need to consider is the physical state. For a gas or a vapor, that's going to come all the way around us and it's going to really challenge our seams and our interfaces, uh, zippers. We have the liquids and aerosols that are more going to be a splash type of event where we might get a liquid against us, but it's generally a small amount that may off gas around us. And then solids. And so we have to look at each of those, of those in terms of how are they going to expose us through the gear. Then we have the potential for skin contact. That is the likelihood that we're going to contact the chemicals. So what type of work are we doing? If we're doing detection and monitoring, chances are good that we're not gonna come into close contact with any high concentrations because we're using our detection and monitoring to keep us out of there. Our recon mission, we generally go down range using information from the detection and monitoring to help us figure out what the scene is, 
investigation is generally longer term and into the event where we've already mitigated some of the threat. Yet when we get into those more likely things, that's where we're dealing with the spill itself. We're trying to fix damaged containers or we're overpacking. Those are types of things where we have to consider that we're likely going to come into contact, whether that's on our skin or on the PPE. And then the risk of immersion. That is an extremely rare type of an event, but it does happen. Generally, it's the immersion because of a high gas concentration around you with a gas that tends to be heavier than air. So when you start thinking about these things, we also have to look at the work locations in figuring out, are we within the spill area? Are we adjacent to that? Or are we away from the spill and containment area? So when we start thinking about somebody doing perimeter work, very unlikely they're gonna come across the chemical itself in any high levels. Yet the person who's doing decon might actually have some off-gassing from somebody who had an exposure. And then the final thing that we have to consider is the time of the exposure. How long is that chemical in contact with the gear and what's the likelihood or the reality of that exposure? This is a thing that came up today. Uh, for earlier, we were talking about decon. And the question came up is, is it better to decon, take longer and do 100%, or is it best to decon as low as you can achieve in the field and get the person out of the suit and then focus on cleaning or showering later? So all kinds of things to keep in mind. Now, when we start selecting our PPE, all of those things should be in the operator's head. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, NFPA 1891. This is a new standard that we're going to be releasing this year. It's in the final process of review in the NFPA process right now. So I hope to see it out on the streets in the fall. But it's the standard on selection, care, and maintenance of hazardous materials, clothing, and equipment. And as we go through this, we have all kinds of questions about flammability, chemical uh, toxicology. Is it even a skin toxic chemical? Is it a solid, a liquid, a gas? And all of these different things that have to come into consideration to choosing your gear. Now we have to remember, I'd say a good half of the people on this call today don't use the National Fire Protection Association standards. They use the standard that's more relevant in their country. So while we may use those as examples, the same process applies across all the different standards. You just have to plug in which garment meets your needs. I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to talk about how we select the chemical warfare agent levels. And then I'll come back on and talk about the toxic industrial chemicals from the hazmat side. So, Jeff? Yeah, thank you, Christina. So I'm going to be talking about some areas that are probably a little bit new to many of you. So we talk about things like protection factors. You may be aware that protection factors are often applied to things like respirators, but they can also be applied to chemical protective clothing. And the reason we talk about protection factors is because protection factors relate essentially to what's in the outside environment and what you're exposed to. So that ratio of outside to inside essentially is a protection factor. And just as they're applied to respirators, the same can be done for protective clothing. But how do we do that? And how? And so we do that by looking at ways of relating a dosage of a particular chemical to its particular impact on an individual. And there's been a lot of science around this. A lot of this is related to chemical warfare agents. And as Christina pointed out, there's a long history of this. So for example, NATO did studies of what types of exposures result in certain types of effects on individuals. There was later work done in Canada that looked at those data to create specific thresholds or exposure levels for which certain types of effects, whether it be things as slight as irritation to some form of systemic irreversible damage, health damage. And then more recently, Dr. Orman from North Carolina State University looked at these very carefully and, and showed how they would apply in an overall integrity test. So one of the things that's important to look at this is that we know that we are concerned about certain chemicals coming in contact with the skin. And many of us may assume that, you know, on the skin at whatever level, 
is basically the same, but that's not necessarily true because as you can imagine, there's different parts of your skin, some of which are thinner or calloused. And so the ability of a chemical to permeate across that skin barrier and cause some kind of localized or systemic effect will differ by the part of the body. So it's important not only to look at this overall protection of say what gets next to your body inside the clothing, but to look at local area effects. And that's what we sometimes call a physiological protective dose factor, which is a lo longer name for protection factor, but essentially means the same thing that takes into account the exposure levels as well as that relative ratio of how sensitive that particular skin will be. If go to the next slide. So the test that I'm talking about that we like to promote for chemical protective clothing that we think has the most valuable information in judging how well protective clothing provides protection is something called a Mannion simulant test. And what this test involves is a simulant, methyl salicylate, which is a surrogate for a chemical warfare agent. Um, an individual wears clothing inside a chamber with a specific concentration of that. And that methyl salicylate is, uh, is generated through a syringe pump to get that concentration. There's a closed chamber where that concentration can be controlled. But the really neat part of this test is the fact that we use these small pads. We call them pads, which stands for a personal absorbent dosimeter. Those dosimeters essentially act like skin. They have a, a mass of an absorbent inside that behind a very thin plastic layer, which simulates the permeation characteristics of skin, and they're placed on different locations of the body, as you can see in the diagram to the right. And from those different locations, especially since they're putting locations where we expect there might be leakage between interfaces or at zippers or other places where there could be breaks or junctures in the protection that you have, this becomes very valuable. And you can see the individual in the right lower corner as having some of those pads affixed to his head in different areas. Next slide. So. The testing, uh, the individual puts has the pads on their body at very specific locations. They wear the protective clothing that they would be that we're trying to evaluate. And they go through a variety of different exercises. Some of them are stationary where they move their body in different ways. They have some more realistic type of exercises or tasks like crawling and pulling a, a victim uh, in a victim drag or climbing a ladder. But there's also a variety of different things. And this is done over a period of 30 minutes. Now, after they come out, of course, the exterior surface of that clothing has been contaminated by this surrogate vapor challenge. And that is um, goes through a decon to remove that particular contaminant. The pads are then removed from the individual and they're subjected to an analysis to show exactly how much the surrogate chemical got into the suit, was able to absorb in onto the pad on the individual skin to be representative of that dose that an individual will receive. So we go to the next slide. So, so this shows a rather detailed table and complicated equation, but in essence, what we do here is we, there, there are 30 different pads and those pads are in different parts of the body. And because you remember that different skin types along different parts of the body have different absorption rates, we look at those in groupings in those different areas. But we also recognize that as we have different pads in different areas, they represent an overall surface area of exposed skin. And so there's a there's a, a formula that we use to take that information from all this analysis so that it takes into account weighing how sensitive the skin is for absorbing the chemical uh, in conjunction with the surface area that's represented by the group of pads that go into that particular body area and then look at this concentration related to its severe effects. In this case, we use a nerve agent, VX, to come up with this justification for averaging and coming up with an overall systemic protection factor. And this is helpful because we have an overall protection factor and then the local protection factor that I described earlier. Next slide. So we look at applying these test results for different types of ensembles. And in the United States and North America, we use the NFPA standards. We have different classes of, of ensembles that are based on their level of protection and the types of concentrations of chemicals that might be expected. 
some of those ensembles are associated with very low respiratory protection, whether it be low risk, and can allow for a air purifying respirator, an APR, whereas other ensembles are at higher levels of risk, whether there's potential for IDLH environments or for that matter, just environments that are considered dangerous requiring higher forms of respiratory protection use a self-contained breathing apparatus. And so I show four different levels here, levels one, two, and three from NFP 1994, as well as NFP 1991, which is a total encapsuling suit, which obviously uses a self-contained breathing apparatus. And so we use, in line with this, apply the scientific-based information for looking at the risks associated with it. So you see these, these designations, EC10, 10, uh, ECT10 and, and ECT01, those are concentrations related to threshold effects. So obviously we wanna be the most stringent at the highest risk levels. And those concentrations are used to judge what type of integrity results using this evaluation should be applied to these different types of ensembles. So we go to the next slide. This shows a table of how we, we have local protection factors. And you can see, again, the, the ensembles for which the highest exposure threats would be considered, uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, fully encapsulating suit, down to a level where there would be almost negligible levels of, uh, of uh, gaseous or vapor-based exposure. And we have different exposure dosages based on that. And the basis of how we came up with these particular numbers, which are, include the exposure threats and the toxic um, aspect of that relative to the, the threat level. To put it in short, is we have a very scientifically based way for judging this. And this has gone through extensive peer review. The US military uses this approach for defining uh, uh, its exposure levels. But within the NFP, we've done our own analysis that's even more stringent in terms of rigorous, in terms of being protective of the individual first responders. We're going to go to the next slide, please. So again, um, just to show the relevance of this, um, there are different aspects of this test that are related to both a nerve agent, which can be both a volatile or skin absorbing um, product for inhalation as well as dermal toxicity, as well as um, uh, skin blister agents. But first, let me address the nerve agents, what we call the G-series agents. And you can see that there's a, a range of concentrations that are included in this in this study, and whereas we use sarin as the more hazardous of this range of products to come up with the levels that we apply for creating the integrity requirements for standards. Now, again, there's a lot of math and there's a lot of uh, abbreviations and other aspects, but the key thing to point out here is that the levels that we select result in negligible decrement in military performance. In other words, there would not be an expected effect for any of the chemicals at the levels that we were that have been chosen for these types of hazards or these lengths of time of wearing. Next slide. So we have um, created overall requirements as well for the system level. And those are based on very similar characterizations where we apply for sarin, and as well as looking at bringing in the skin blister agents such as uh, mustard. And we have those same types of threshold values, but you can see that, again, this hierarchy of performance. So again, there's a great deal of science, validated science that work that's been done to demonstrate the safety of these levels and to relate these back to operational performance and as well as the overall toxicity of the product itself. So you can see a dramatic switch for say, you know, the highest form of protection, NFP 1991, going down to class one, going down to class two, going down to class three, where there's a relatively draw, large drop off. But then of course we recognize that there's a commensurate expectation of not only the higher threat levels for those more higher performing products, but also the types of respiratory protection that goes involved with that, the expected exposure doses, and the expected ways that the threshold effects would be applied to an individual. So it's important, again, to recognize when we talk about a protective ensemble and its performance, that there needs to be science behind it. And this is probably 
the the best science that's been produced in terms of creating a basis for proposed recommended integrity requirements of a protective ensemble. And the next slide is the, the last slide that I'll be covering. So one of the things that's I think that's important from all this is it's easy to get really good protection. Now, I'm not saying that facetiously. I mean, it is easy to come up with, say, a product that's a very good barrier that fully encapsulates an, an individual that seemingly provides the best possible protection. But as I like to say to everyone in the PPE realm is, just by wearing PPE, you're creating immediate trade-offs. There are things you can't do as well as if you're not wearing the PPE functionally or for a specific mission, whether it's being able to see, touch and manipulate things, even to walk and move. Those are trade-offs that you have to make. So it's very important that when protection levels are set, that they're set commensurate to the risk, the threat of exposure and the potential impact of that exposure, which is part of that risk. So as we use these different levels of integrity, we realize for the very high threat levels, we need high protection. But for many functions where those threat levels don't exist, in fact, for the vast majority, as you'll see later in some of the slides that Christina presents, that you're trading off dramatically comfort and functionality of your ensembles. So it's important to get these right because as Christina said in her opening, that we know that many of the accidents that occur are often done because the people can't do the job that they're trying to do and may be overprotected, which by itself creates hazards. And so I'll turn it over to you, Christina. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And so one of the things that I wanted to bring up on this slide as well is when Jeff was talking about that ability to do different work, if you look at this, uh, the numbers along the bottom here, if we want somebody to do a specific task and we put them in our ultra high protection, we expect them to do that task in 30 minutes. If we instead put them down in this level of protection all the way down to the right, they need to do that same exact task in half the time. And so that's how we challenge it when we look at the types of work that you need to do in the length of time that you'll be downrange, you get that increase in comfort and tactility but you're trading off the levels of protection, you're also gaining less heat stress. So it's all about balance. Now, the other thing to keep in mind when you start looking at these um, effective dose rates is that when we look at it from a military perspective, the high end of no threat, where we say that there's, there's negligible effects on the operator, is at ECT 16. And so we're staying well within the negligible threats area when we use our endpoints of one, two, one percent, two percent, and ten percent, all being well below that sixteen percent where we still have negligible effects on the operator. I'm going to go in now and talk about a variety of different uh, toxic industrial chemicals that we also challenged. So first, I want to bring up, I'm going to show you some data from Andy Burns, and hopefully Andy's on here today, but this is from uh, Utah Valley University, and they were the lead on the operator side of things in what in the U.S. we call the jackrabbit studies. And so there's going to be a few bits of data I'm going to show you here, and you'll see the references down at the bottom. And on one slide, I actually have the link so that if you're watching it later, you can just click on that link and get you directly over to that jackrabbit site because the data there is critical to understanding based upon the task you're going to do the time from time zero when the event occurred all of those things play a huge role so the first thing i'm going to show you is one of the events that we modeled prior to picking our endpoints for um, the nfpa standards and what works out really nicely here is that Andy's team on the Jackrabbit project ended up doing almost the exact same release in real time. So we have real data to back up our models. So very kind of cool to me. But in this scenario, sorry for those of you down south, but we picked Atlanta, Georgia. 
and we were looking at an area where the railway crosses the road. And when I used to work uh, down in that area and driving back through the West End going out to Douglasville, we would end up having to wait for the train all the time. And there would be our people just crawling up and over the train versus waiting for the train to disappear because it was moving so slowly with the hazardous chemicals through downtown. So this scenario was literally somebody opening up the valve on the top of the car and releasing all of the contents. And so whether that be a mechanical breach or just literally opening up the top, any of those things, but the goal was a 52 minute release of 17,000 gallons of liquid chlorine. Okay, we use the environmental conditions from the day that we were evaluating things of 86 degrees Fahrenheit, 57% relative humidity, in a wind uh, of four miles per hour from the south southeast. And so that helped us with determining what were the levels that we would expect to see from a chlorine release from a tank car outside. Okay. And so what we found was that out to about 118 yards is where we saw uh, 10,000 parts per million. And that was in the very early, immediately following the release. OK, we saw a class. So a 350 parts per million went farther out to 688 yards. And then that 40 parts per million was out beyond 1.3 miles. So seriously problematic there. And if you look at the city of Atlanta, this is a very populated area coming up through. But that would be over a 52 minute period. The concentrations that we were concerned about in terms of ultra high levels were completely dissipated within the first 10 minutes of the incident. And so for sheltering in place levels, we literally were going out greater than six miles, which matched up closely with what we were expecting for the emergency response guidebook. And so what we were concerned about was slight changes in wind direction could really affect where we were. But when we looked at it all, the area that we expected, even though that close in, probably not very, uh, good quality on the model we were using because we were using the, the models that we would use in the field, but right in close to get greater than 10,000 parts per million, we were literally within 100 yards of the actual release from the tank car in those first few minutes. So this is where I brought up what Andy was working on. And right here is your link to the Utah Valley University website for the Jackrabbit data. They have training materials on their videos showing all the different releases, as well as all of the sensor data for all the sensors that were used to validate the amounts of chlorine that were seen across this. So what was interesting to find out was that the Aloha models that we had run earlier using the standard Aloha model, while they were a little bit off, this new rail car model that came out was very close in to what we saw in that first hour following the release, which was what we were trying to model. And so we start looking at this and you see these areas out to four kilometers where you might be over 50 parts per million, okay? Areas of concern. But if we look at 85 meters out from the actual release, we were at, at 10 minutes in less than 10 minutes, right there at the 10,000 parts per million. So when we start coming out here, the line should be actually over here about 10 minutes, but it was right there that we started seeing that no matter what, when we had these 20 ton tank car releases, the chlorine dropped below 10,000 parts per million in the 10 minutes. And so what we were looking for the 10 minutes reasoning was we wanted to know from time zero of the event occurring to being deployed to arriving to actually starting the response to it, what's the concentration we should expect at that point in time? And so at that point, we chose the 10 minutes. We could have gone a little higher up to that 20,000 parts per minute. We went down to five minutes. But what we looked for here was that part right around 10 minutes. And the data that came out of Jackrabbit validated our 10,000 part per million challenge pretty closely. We were at 10 minutes versus 11 minutes with theirs. Same type of thing, this is using Jazz, uh, one of the sensors, and doing the measurements. And again, if you look at the 10 minutes versus the 10,000 parts per million, 
you can see that yes, in the 10 minutes using real time readings from sensors, we were down at that average level that we were looking for. And this is why we chose our high end 10,000 parts per million, because we were looking at an outdoor release of a tank car full of chlorine as our worst case scenario outdoors. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. Okay, so now when we started looking at that, we went back and said, for the immediate response, that less than 10 minutes, what is what should we expect? And so reality was within 500 meters of the system, okay, so we had measurements at 85 meters, they were around 65,000 parts per million at uh, 0.6 minutes. At 120 meters, it dropped down to 55,000 parts per million at 0.7 minutes. And then at 200 meters, it dropped down to 44,000 parts per million at 1.3 minutes. So you can see that it's quickly dropping down. And reality is at 1,000 meters, you are already down below 2,000 parts per million at seven minutes. So by the time you get in to that response zone and get in there and start making a difference, you're already below 2,000 parts per million. And so when we went out to the 2K, the, the two kilometers out, you were down to 600 parts per million. And so these are some of the reasons why we chose the answers that we chose. Now I grayed out the class two and the class three because reality is you wouldn't have anybody doing these types of events in the first three minutes. You end up having to go back uh, and they come into play here. And I think somebody's asking what model did we use? We actually were using Aloha and we followed it up with some HPAC models as well. And that allowed us to get a couple of different models and focusing in on the different threats. And I'm gonna show you through a lot of different ones. But in the continued response, that greater than 10 minutes where we're actually going to start doing the work. So we ended up within 500 meters of the tank, we still need to be in a class one type of suit. That would allow us to work closely with doing plumbing and patching if we needed to, any types of um, freeze patches, that type of thing, uh, transferring, all of that we could get within that 500 meters. Out beyond that, we ended up in that class two type of arena where we are at 350 parts per million or less. And then the class three was where we were doing things out for the evacuations and the decon type of thing. The interesting thing to note is that even though we're saying we don't want any material to get in, chlorine doesn't start to in and degrade the skin's integrity to around 500 parts per million after 10 minutes continuous at that level. So while we're always using the inhalation threat, reality is we have created two ways of providing ourselves with extra safety. And that safety is not only because we use the inhalation exposure, we also use the exposure for up to 60 minutes in some cases. And then we also don't take into account that the chemical doesn't actually interact with the skin until much higher concentrations. So now the next one that we did was an ammonia release indoors. This is what we thought would be one of our highest levels uh, or concentrations of gas phase material we did dealing with. So in this case, we went with a uh, high pressure receiver on an ammonia tank, 7,000 pounds capacity, and we had a 70,000 square foot freezer uh, warehouse. So what we did here was using the approximate weight of five pounds per gallon, we were able to figure out that we had about 1,400 gallons of uh, material. The enclosed room, we had the 40 feet height, and then we had a 70,000 feet square feet, and that gave us a 2.8 million cubic feet in the space, which resulted in a gas concentration of 62,500 uh, as our what we expected our ammonia concentration to kind of equilibrate at without any type of intervention. That's if we have a completely closed space, no ventilation occurring. So we ended up in an environment, which we fully expected, that was toxic, corrosive and flammable. And so in this case, this is the reason why we still talk about having that, I call it my Mac Daddy suit, uh, 
But the suit that provides us with that ultra high protection integrated with flash protection, because this is the environment that you're looking at that for. Now, if we were to change the environment some by increasing ventilation or by dropping the ammonia into a liquid by putting water on it, okay, not everybody wants us to do that, but it is one way to drop the levels, you could get down pretty quickly down below 10,000 parts per million and still be able to go in and do some of that work. I would still say that if I'm dealing with this tank itself and any potential rupture to that tank, I'm going to go in and wear that Mac Daddy suit, which is the highest level of protection we can get. And that allows me to fully work with the liquid expanding out. Now, if we take it a little bit differently and do the ammonia release outdoors, obviously for all of these incidents, I blurred out where the model was done just because I don't want industry industry to be upset that we use them as our worst case scenario. But in this case, we had 19,000 pounds or 3,800 gallons of liquid ammonia tank outside of a uh, processing facility. We are going to estimate a catastrophic release of that ammonia caused by disruption of a five inch valve located at 18 inches from the bottom of the tank. We're going to assume a mechanical disruption of the valve so that we can't fix it. And so in this case, we're saying, this is something that we're going to have to have a continuous leak. We may get freezing in the plug and then have a slow release that's going to go on until we have a chance to fix it. But the winds are going to be at four miles per hour. So these are the different uh, models. And I went ahead and redid them because this is what we first used was the traditional Aloha tank model. And then when the new rail car model came out, we updated and, and did this and found that the rail car model provided us with much more accurate compared to what we actually saw during some of these releases we had had. Um, whereas the traditional Aloha model was much a broader spectrum release. So what we ended up with is any of the PPE within uh, that close end ranges, you were definitely in the class one type of gear. You were way below your 10,000 parts per million. To get down below the 350, we actually had a bigger space. Now, this space goes away pretty quickly depending upon what type of day or night. So if you have an inversion layer, it'll hold it down longer. But it's really about it holding close to the ground until it warms up and then it moves off and does its thing. So reality is, while these were the initial isolation zones, they ended up being shrunk down pretty quickly because this event occurred during the daytime and we were able to model everything and match it up to what we had for readings. Another one that we went through and did was just looking at a potential hydrogen cyanide attack in a subway because this is talked about a lot. So in terms of a Moog Talker type incident, so where we had potassium cyanide maybe in a solution and sulfuric acid and we're mixing those things together. We used the average size of a subway car of 229 cubic meters, and there's just two different types that we looked at. But reality is, at this case, we were only getting around 900 parts per million as the maximum concentration. In this case, I would really resort to wearing turnout gear, because in my uh, background, we wear turnout gear for many incidents if they are high flammability with no dermal toxicity. Hydrogen cyanide, you have to get many times lethal limits to actually get it to go through your skin. And to put this in perspective, if somebody wanted to actually get a level that exceeded the 10,000 parts per million challenge we gave ourselves, they would have needed to bring 10 kilograms or 22 pounds of the precursor onto that subway. And again, we're looking at making sure we're staying out of that flammability level and going down below that 10% of it, which so we're looking at 5,600 parts per million we want to be below. We're well below that. I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff for a bit, and then I'll come back on for a few final things. So, Jeff? So, thank you, Christina. So, Christina's gone through a lot of different scenarios of types of incidents that a first responder could be exposed to. 
And, and obviously some of this is based on some assumptions and some various scenarios that have real life basis. But one of the things I think it's important to realize as we were talking about before, particularly when I was talking about the man and simulant test that's used to look at what level of integrity the clothing should have, what protection factor it should offer, is to, to include obviously an understanding of how those risks occur with different types of operational functions and why there is a definite need to have different levels of protection. I mean, there's been a lot of teams that have have a multitude of different protective outfits depending on the situations they face, but I think it becomes very more important to see how this works. And if you define these in terms of how likely you're to have contact, what type of physical environment you're gonna be operating in and what length of time you may be involved in performing whatever activity that it is, you can see that there are really good reasons to have these different levels of protection based on what you're doing. So um, if we take a function such as initial reconnoitering with a response scene where um, there is going to be an extra level of care used by in most part, most cases, very highly trained first responders. It's not like I, when I was in the Coast Guard where people would rush into an event. There's obviously a more protracted thinking trained response. And so your level of contact will be at a certain, certain level where you are going to be avoiding, as Christina pointed out. Your physical environment could be very quite varied, but generally you're gonna be in there in and out. So your exposure time would be low. And so this kind of defines one type of protection. You can see how a, um, a low level of protection like NFP 1994 class three would be well. Whereas in contrast to that, if you have a situation where you know that there's a specific manifestation of exposure that's occurring, there's a leak that requires to be patched, some mitigation activity is required. Your likelihood of contact is substantially higher. It could be ultra high. You could be directly exposed to spewing gas to be able to do the function that you're required to do. You have to assume that you need the highest physical protection there. But again, you're gonna to wanna to moderate the amount of time, but still um, there will be a need for a very high protection as defined in our case, NFP 1994 class one or class two protection or NFP 1991. So there's different aspects. And this can also be related to just the simple handling or transfer of products. So going to another area where you may be doing something that's a little more peripheral to the event, in other words, not directly where the leak or spill or direct substances uh, like damming off or diking or absor using absorbents or trying to neutralize a chemical in place. Again, there's a likelihood of exposure that is moderate. Uh, the physical protection areas are moderate, it's more controlled circumstances. The length of time could be moderate, again, limiting exposure to that which is necessary. And in that level can be somewhat lower. Um, when you go through decontamination, obviously an individual is going from the hot zone to the warm zone will have really the only the contamination they have is what's on them. And that obviously still represents a threat but that threat is lower, less lower uh, likelihood of contact. The physical protection is less, it's a more controlled event, but this could be a, a longer term event, particularly for a decontamination line where the decontamination assistance personnel are involved for extensive periods of times. And again, you can see how that could relate down to a lower level of protection. Likewise, there's investigation and perimeter operations that are all low. And depending on the the environment where they're, they're they're um, being conducted in, they can be from moderate to low. But generally, these kinds of operations take period over a, a longer time frame, and consequently, um, they that protection is demanded for that longer time frame. But still, the level of protection provided by, say, a level three uh, ensemble would be appropriate. So, again, it's very important to take all this into perspective. So, if we go to the next slide. Well talk about a real world environment. So back uh, many years ago in the United States, Graniteville, South Carolina, there was an extensive uh, derailment where um, uh, a number of uh, individuals were uh, severely hurt. And in fact, there were deaths involved with this. So it's interesting to relate this 
lay all this discussion we've had to date uh, to, on the today's call back to a real life event. So what would this mean? So, you know, there is obviously a wreck and there's not first responders right there on the scene. So there are people that can be seen at the, that they're in, in the area that's exposed and they're self evacuating. So decisions can be made about what level of protection is necessary based on observations uh, that are provided by both the public and by the response teams. And so, you know, obviously individuals that were trying to go in to help, they could either smell and they may not have had the right protection. So here is an instance where a recommendation specific for the search and rescue aspects, which is in a, in a moderate time frame, would have dictated a class one ensemble, which is relatively rugged, has a reasonably high level of protection, would be at levels because there are self-evacuating people that would be uh, easily within the level realm of protection. Uh, then, of course, uh, there is the adjacent areas where the potential spread of the chemical uh, occurred, and and those could be based on uh, different time dynamics of the release situation itself, and the ability of a, an individual to understand what specific um, requirements are need for going deeper into that uh, area where the leakages occur. So obviously a higher level of protection it could be warranted. It still could be an NFP 1994 class one ensemble. And then of course, when people go directly up to that, that, that uh, event in terms of trying to mitigate and stem the release of the chemical or evolved in the transfer of the chemical, certain higher levels could be dictated. So just in this very perspective of looking at an actual event, you can see the different classifications of ensembles, the different threat levels, and be able to apply the systemic approach to evaluating threat, the, the conditions, physical environment, the uh, amount of time that would be necessary for involvement in these kinds of situations. So we go to the next slide. So again, further on this, um, we have um, the observation that there are people within that zone of release, you know, some peripherally, that are able to evacuate and how they're handled for decontamination uh, because, they're, because they were not subjected to high concentrations, they're self-evacuating and therefore uh, relatively low levels of, of, um, of protection can be assumed, but still protection is needed. And this is certainly an activity that takes place that's away from the specific release zone itself. And the expectation is that those individual responders involved in um, mass decontamination would be uh, involved in that activity for an extended period of time. And then, of course, you have people that are well outside the warm zone in the cordoned off area and that there would be uh, individuals creating per a perimeter around the event, and as has happened, those those individuals would be well enough away from the event where no particular protection would be needed. So this is just a way of relating what Christina went into detail with some very specific scenarios back to an actual event that happened and what types of protective clothing would be recommended in that type of event. So I want to go to another slide because this brings up uh, a key area of concern. You know that um, there are many individuals that um, believe that it's essential, of course, to protect the breathing apparatus because we recognize that the self-contained breathing apparatus that's worn by a first responder is protecting their, 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 uh, themselves from inhalation of whatever toxic contaminants exist. And, and typically, almost exclusively, some very few exceptions, that inhalation of toxic chemicals is by far a more uh, fatal route of entry as compared to dermal absorption where higher levels of concentrations in chemicals in, in vapor can be sustained. So the, you know, as a, as a chemical engineer, I can tell you that chemicals take the path of least resistance when they're in the environment. And that's obviously very true for uh, first responders and the protective clothing that they wear. So the question comes up, how well does self-contained breathing apparatus work? So in the United States, fortunately, we had a very systematic, comprehensive research program that looked at how protective SCBA were. We looked at different classes of chemicals. 
whether they were normally gases, whether they're vapor liquids that would have high vapor pressure and evolve vapors at high at concentrations, and whether they were relatively non-volatile chemicals, so that they may be more persistent, and examined how breathing apparatus functioning as they would be used, in other words, going through a breathing cycle with the exhalation, inhalation aspects, um, and doing the same exposures that these are commensurate with the ensemble, and found that the SCBA that were rated for CBRN, as well as powered air purifying respirators for an air purifying device using filters, also rated for CBRN, did quite well. And and this was this was uh, a sure reassuring because we knew that these devices are already tested against military agents like sarin and mustard to get their CBRN designation. But the fact is that we, they hadn't been tested for many industrial chemicals, whether it be ammonia or chlorine or toluene or other chemicals that are equally likely for or more likely rather for first responders to encounter. So this testing demonstrably showed that this these breathing apparatus function to provide the level of continued protection for that individual's respiratory protection. And I think that was a very, very important conclusion because a lot of assumptions are generally made about this, but here is test data, in fact, to demonstrate that it in fact does provide that protection. So Christine, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So. What we were talking about here was focusing in on designing for responders by responders. So when we redid these standards, we went out and worked with the operational community, did a lot of surveys with everybody, but actually brought in different responders onto the committees to make sure that their voice was heard. And one of the things that we were really trying to push for was operators getting certified ensembles that met their level of risk and so we know how to do risk assessments in the field that's what we do but we needed to be able to get more information about the different materials and designs of things to ensure that we could choose the appropriate material based upon the risk that we were actually having so when we start looking at strong PPE standards, what we wanted were things that took into account our operational environment. So the type of work that we were doing, the location of that work, where, how close were we were to the actual leak, the type of work, what type of workload were we doing? Was it a sustained work for a period of time? Uh, so that duration that we had, the toxicity of the materials, both inhalation and dermal, because remember, in order to always err on the side of safety, we've gone the order of magnitude up and said, we're gonna follow everything as if it's an inhalation, even though we're really dealing with a dermal threat. And then the flammability of the materials. So as we started looking through all of these things, I was one of the ones who ran the models in the beginning, and we had uh, more than I showed you, obviously, but we ran model after model of different types of incidents to find out at time zero, at time 10, at time uh, 60 minutes, what were the levels that we were seeing, both indoors, outdoors leaks, and the types of things that we do as responders to ensure that we were designing things that would meet our need. In addition, when it went to the military chemicals, the chem bio rad new types of materials. So in this case, we actually stick to the chem, and we were doing uh, sarin as tested by Soman because it's actually gonna stick there longer, and then sulfur mustard. We went with the levels that the DOD felt were operationally relevant, and then we just doubled them because we thought, well, if it's relevant to you, we want to be on the side of uh, safety, so we're gonna err on that side, and we're gonna go, instead of a 10 gram per square centimeter challenge, we're gonna go with a 20. And so, we always did the airing on the side of safety. We tried to make the numbers operationally relevant so that people could apply them while still giving themselves that big factor of safety. So with that, that was all we had. And we do have some time for questions. I did see one question at first. Let me pop this up so I can see it better. Okay. I've got to 
see this out. I had one question in the very beginning that was from Mike Allen, and it was, um, what humidity was it when you did the models? So the models actually used a whole series of different humidities, but we did actually, in many cases, go to the highest humidity we could in higher, higher humidity and temperature profile, knowing that that would allow us to get a higher chance for permeation. And so we did go to the highest levels and that was intentional to make it as hard as we could. Okay, Hasim is with regards to the NFPA 1994 mist, are there any data available or are you aware of situations where decontamination has resulted in penetration permeation through PPE and resulted in higher readings? And if so, are there any steps within the standard to account for this? I'm going to say no, um, that we have not had that occur when it was employed properly. But Jeff, you have sat through many a missed trial. And so have right. you ever seen it where the decon actually caused the permeation or penetration? Uh, no, we, we don't have any evidence of that. There's, um, you know, this test is done in a very controlled fashion. So granted that there can be some mistakes made. For example, um, someone can have a pad that comes loose off their body during the test, and there could be the incomplete decontamination of an individual. But we also use a lot of controls. So we use pads in areas to see, you know, for example, in the doffing area, is there going to be a level of exposure that could falsely affect pads? So to the best of my knowledge, with these controls in place, when the test is conducted, we haven't had that instance where, say, the decontamination pushed or somehow affected the um, performance of the product. Instead, um, what we see is generally that the controls are able to pick up on any kind of nuances in the test that may lead to some false interpretations. Okay, um, next question we have is Frank Sullivan. And Frank's just asking if it's possible to share the PAPR SCBA study information. And, and yes, so that actually has been released now, but could you please email us and we could send it to you? Yes. Is that correct, um, Jeff? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so that's gone through the Department of Defense's Public Affairs Office. And of course, it's very generic, the information. We're not presenting on specific product types. Those are all been uh, genericized, uh, exactly. yes. blinded essentially. But certainly that's information that's being made, that's being made, has been made available or will be made available. Uh, and then we'll get that out to you. It is a, I'll warn you that it is a relatively long and complex report. So it's very exciting. And Dave Barry, we're going to send it to you too. I hope if you haven't already received it. Uh, Dave has the next question is, is the slide concerning exposure to the SCBA slash APR? So the same slide. What were the test chemicals in group A? B, and C. Okay, I'm going off the top of my memory here. So we had, um, there was ammonia and chlorine, were the two, uh, two out of group A. We also had methyl chloride. Uh, in group B, we had acrolein, tetrahydrofuran, um, ethyl diethylamine, and ethyl acetate. And then for group C, we had toluene, tetrachloroethylene, and sulfuric acid. That was good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Robert Ferris was, what is the scope of work you've labeled recon, and why is this a low-level risk of exposure? So that was me. I was lab labeling recon as, from, from my purview, when we go downrange our first time, we're generally getting a lot of information to send back, more camera, more detection, where we're bringing our detection monitoring equipment in. And so we tend to back out when we get to levels that might be above the uh, level that we're wearing. And so your risk of exposure into actually touching the chemical, unless it's surrounding you, is usually pretty low. Now, some people do recon differently where they go in with an ultra high level of protection and then come out and then reduce their protection if um, warranted. I do it the opposite where we go down with a lower level of protection, 
with appropriate monitoring and protocols in place to say, if we need to, we'll up our protection, but we're going to monitor and make sure that we are going downrange with the appropriate uh, measurements. Uh, Michael Fagan also asked, was there any mechanical conditioning done of the suits prior to conducting the permeation testing? And yes, absolutely. And uh, the NFPA standards, when we do any permeation testing, and this is really related to the last talk versus this one, because that's where we really talked about permeation. But yes, the mechanical conditioning is both flexing and abrading. And Jeff, I don't know if you remember the cycles off the top of your head. But yeah, it's about 100, I think it's 100 cycles. We, there's two different categories within NFPA where it goes from what we would call baseline uh, to a ruggedized level. So the ruggedized level has more abrasion cycles and more um, uh, flexing cycles to replicate the expected use and the more duress created on the ensemble from the environmental conditions. So it, it's, it, is, it is robust, it is unique. Uh, most test data, as you can imagine, does not include those kind of physical parameters as part of a precondition for how they're reported by industry as a whole. Yeah, and Michael, I don't wanna lead you astray. That's what we do for mechanical conditioning of the materials that are evaluated in the NFPA standards, NF 1994, 1991 for permeation. Uh, when you see the tables that come out that are breakthrough tables from manufacturers, they very rarely have any mechanical conditioning. It's usually done on pristine material. So very different situation. And depending upon what standard you're looking at, that may be the case as well. But in the NFPA 1991 and 1994, yes, we precondition with flexing and abrading. And I, let me see if there's any, oh, there are some, okay. Could you please expand on the risks of absorption through the ear? Oh, oh, so that was very back in the beginning and it was talking about the ear skin. It's really the back of the ear skin being so thin that it increases permeation. And so Jeff, that was back in the slide, actually one of your, your first slide. Yeah, so remember that um, one of the things we were trying to point out is that skin absorption isn't uniform over the body and that skin thickness, you know, depending on where it is on the body, can be very different. And so to account for that, those effects, we assign different ratios for the mist testing to allow for that assumption because the pad itself is just absorbing chemical that may pass into the suit. But based on their placement, on the individual's body, then we want to make sure that when we talk about a specific body area that we indicate that there may be a greater threat for that portion of the body if it has greater skin absorption owing to the fact that the skin may be thinner or allow for greater skin absorption. So, you know, in fact, as an antidote here, um, you know, firefighters rely, unfortunately, still some still do rely on using their ears as an early detection for thermal exposure, which is a bad, bad practice, uh, but that's probably why. <laughs> yes. Certainly don't do that for chemicals at all. So. Yes. So, well, we used to always talk about how you could feel that burning in your ears and we lost that capability when we went to wearing the hoods. Right. But now for a chemical exposure, when you have like a line of sight type of snag and grab, we used to always talk about you could feel the burning first around your ears and for the boys, you would feel it somewhere near your boys. Um, so <laughs> those things were always our first warnings that the chemical concentration was in the thousands of levels when we didn't have a detector yet because the boys' boys were our detector. Um, couple of questions from Dave Ferry again on the SCBA APR test. Uh, for the SEBA APR test, what was the failure criteria and was any degradation data observed or collected? So the answer is, uh, on the first part, is we looked at a, a number of different occupational exposure levels. Um, we actually analyzed each chemical and looked that we ultimately decided to set this on a very, on a, on a stack level using the worst performance, the, the worst performance 
occupational exposure level. The, the one that we ended up going towards recommending is what the Eagle 2 uh, level, uh, which is particularly relevant for first responders. Um, in terms of degradation effects of the SCB, obviously we observed um, deposition of some chemicals, particularly, uh, well, some of the liquid chemicals that are persistent, they were applied as as the liquid directly on the SCBA, whereas in the other cases, those those chemicals would uh, be provided in the form of a gas or vapor exposure. So the devices are all functional. The chemicals that we had the most trouble with in terms of degradation effects wasn't so much on the SCBA, but on the equi test equipment, which included chlorine, which obviously does a number on certain types of metals, and uh, methyl chloride, which also had some similar degradation effects. I remember the first chamber that didn't do so well. <laughs> yeah, we had to. We actually had a stainless steel chamber that we started out with that then became a Teflon chamber afterwards. <laughs> and then the other question Dave had was, are there different failure pass criteria for the harness cylinder and or the face piece visor? Um, we specifically looked at the protection of the inhalation air and the and it's and so the you might have noticed that in that one slide the photograph there was a cylinder missing. This is this is due to the fact that we're trying to maintain the the volume exposure volume to all the key components of the SCBA in this case, which includes a uh, you know the the pneumatics and the face piece as it's fitted onto a, a face a head form, and so um, we did not apply this specifically to uh, uh, say the aramid based. Um, harness system or back frame as you can see those parts are missing however um, we have we had looked at those areas from a from a literature search standpoint and looked at those effects on on the components and obviously there's concerns potentially for contamination but in terms of effects towards failure it takes really high concentrations for many of those materials to be affected in a way that would cause failure whether it be a Kevlar stamp strap, some of the electronics or plastic components, they're nowhere near the levels that would cause uh, immediate or direct effects that would cause failures uh, of the product overall. And one of the things that's really important to bring forward and remember is when we talk, and we said this earlier, when you decontaminate on scene, that is not the end of it. You still have to do a thorough cleaning of your SCBA. And that should happen after every fire, after every use. When you are going back, not only do you do the on-field decon that you do, but you still have to go back and clean it. Decon and cleaning are two very different things. And so one of the things that we did see is proper cleaning in a timely manner will provide you with gear that will last, um, right. even after these types of exposures. And, and just the fact that you brought up the fire service situation, Christine, I think that's worth elaborating on. Obviously, firefighters wear their SCBA externally as part of their ensemble and go into ideal H environments with all kinds of different contaminants being present for extended periods of times. And, and, and granted, we, we are teaching now uh, that those need to be going through extensive decontamination, not just the the field decontamination, but often cleaning afterwards as well. So it's 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 I think it's apt to point out that there's been a practice where SCBA have been exposed to relatively significant forms of contamination and have been effectively decontaminated when applied properly. Okay, Jeff. Well, that was our last question that had come in. So I'm glad that we were able to answer them online with you guys again this time. If you didn't notice, uh, for, or for those who weren't participating in the first webinar, we did send out a link to the webinar itself if you want to see the first one, but we also followed it up with a white paper that we had written on the topic. We're going to do the same thing with this one, where we'll go into more detail on some of the information. I will try to get this video posted as soon as I can, so within the next day or two, and then I'll follow up with an email to everybody letting you know that it's there, the link to it, so that you can go ahead and look at it further if you want or share it with colleagues. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Jeff and I. Um, our emails are 
up here as well as our cell phone numbers. And one more time, if you are going to call us on our cell phones, please text us first to let us know who you are and what you're calling for to make sure that we actually answer it. Because like everybody else, our phones are inundated with telemarketers calling. And so if we don't recognize the number, neither of us generally answer it. With that, I just wanna say thank you all again for joining us, uh, especially those of you at obscene hours of the evening. Uh, and stay safe out there. And if there's anything we can do to help, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, everybody. I uh, hope that you enjoyed the content. And again, please uh, bring any questions to us that you might have after looking at this online or just after the teleconference itself. Thanks, guys.